And if you think, a lot of people don't realize that. When you go to the bank, if you want to pull out all your money, there's a good chance that you can't today yep. or tomorrow. Because why would they keep all that money on hand when they can just move zeros around? And people talk about digital currency. Well, what do you think a credit card is? Everybody, this is the Money Hole Podcast. I'm Chris Lamb. Please make sure to like, subscribe, download, and leave a comment. And today I'm here with my good friend, Paul. Thanks for coming. Of course. Thanks for doing this. And you said you just showed up from the job site? Kind of. I was actually had, a, uh, I guess you could say, an aggressive month where I was in escrow for four homes. And to occupy myself, I decided to remodel a bathroom. Okay. And that's a, <laughs> is that something you've done in the past? Uh, yes. Remodeling? I would say... Uh, I was a mechanic by trade before I was in the military. My dad was a contractor. So I'm the, your typical jack of all trades, master of none. Man, you're braver than me. I, you don't want me remodeling a bathroom. That's for sure. Well, I appreciate you coming and doing this on short notice. Um, so I wanted to ask you a couple questions. Um, you know, for, for people that are watching you and I, how did we meet? When did we meet? Two years ago? We met via phone. I think I, maybe a year and a half ago yep. through a friend of a friend. Yeah. Yeah. You called me and I remember we were talking and, you know, I've been on the phone my, for 30 years talking to people. And I remember I was on my way out. It was like end of a day and you called me. And as soon as we started talking, we hit it off. And I think we had talked for like 55 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that connected us was your passion for uh, real estate mm -hmm. and seeing it as a, an opportunity to, you know, make passive income. But the other thing that we had talked about was your military experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, for people that are watching, you were a Navy SEAL from in what year? 2010 to 2021. I okay. Believe. So 11 years. It, and I think it was, I'm probably saying it wrong then. Cause it was 10, it's definitely 10 years. I, yeah. I'm pretty sure I got in 20, yeah, 2011, but it was late 2011. That's what it was like December of 2011. Okay. Well, you're a humble guy. I mean, even before we started the cameras, you're like, I don't want this to be about how cool I am. And I respect that so much about you. But I think it's important for guys like you to realize that guys like me, we're really interested in because I've always understood that, you know, buds and Navy SEALs are the elite of the elite and some of they've gone through some really tough things. And so I was thinking about this today. A question I wanted to ask you was, what made you decide to become a Navy SEAL? Well, like any thing you want to do with your life, it was a series of smaller things that kind of added up. At the time I had just bought, I shouldn't say just bought, but sometime before that I had bought my first home mm -hmm. and this was my, I just became a kind of just became a religious person right around that same time. And I had a, a mentor who had got me, talked me into buying this house and I told me I should get roommates. So I got roommates, which is kind of the beginning of, I would say, uh, real estate investing. I didn't even know it. Was that here in Reading? That was in Reading. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And my first roommate actually was a recon Marine. And gotcha. he had, he had just got back from Fallujah and I didn't realize it, but he was definitely uh, struggling and fighting with some demons. And I remember I was out mowing my lawn and at the time, you know, I'm in board shorts, you know, sandals mowing your lawn, which what you shouldn't do. And I had a really <laughs> nice custom hot rod I built in this beautiful home I'd remodeled. And I'm like, what have I done to deserve all this besides show up on time and clock in and just, you know, I didn't really, I didn't feel like I'd risked or earned where I was at. Mm -hmm. And at some point in my life, I wanted to be able to feel like I'd earned my freedom. And that was kind of the beginning. And on top of that, uh, my, fa my father didn't serve, my grandfather did serve, and my uncles had served. And so I kind of felt that call to serve as well. And ultimately, th there was a piece of me that... um my dad and I had a healthy father son battle mm -hmm. always. Like we, we fist fought before. Um, we did, we rode motorcycles together. We fished together and he was definitely my dad. But as I got older, I was definitely the young bull trying to push the old bull. And I also wanted to kind of one up him. So I'm like, okay, if I'm going to join the military, I might as well do something that's awesome. Go to the top. <laughs> well, believe it or not, my recon Marine buddy had actually talked me into the air force. He's like, man, you want to be an Air Force PJ. And all my team guy buddies, if they ever hear this, they're going to blow, they're going to be not happy about it. But like, you want to be a PJ because- What is a PJ? Sorry. PJ <laughs> is Air Force Pararescuemen. So okay. they're, um, 
special operations, I would say elite medical unit, I okay. guess you could call it. That's easiest way. So they, they're a whole separate program. Their primary mission is uh, search and rescue for down aviation. Okay. But the mission window is so small, they don't get activated for that specific mission. So a lot of times they'll attach to other units as their primary medic. Okay. But they're great. They're high speed. Uh, I've never met one knock on wood who wasn't highly intelligent and, and good to go. And I've, I've deployed with several PJs and liked all of them. But either way, he sent me down that rabbit trail, went to the Air Force recruiter. I went through a bunch of their rigmarole, got DQ'd for my vision, and I had a bad uh, shoulder at the time. And as I was walking out, the Navy recruiter's like, you ever thought about joining the Navy? And at the time, I was like, no, man. I've got a job, I've got a life. I haven't even researched this. I'm, a high, I'm into researching stuff. But he's like, come do a PST. And at the time, you had to compete for your position to go to buds and it was based off your pst score and i went and pst and i did really well i think i was top three for our region which is like san francisco to portland and the guy was like hey you want to go next week i'm like no man I'm, I'm, a, I'm a grown man i have a job i've got like a house i can't just leave how old were you at the time i think i was 20 oh man 23 okay 23 man i'm bad at this i should know these numbers but so yeah i Delayed six months. And I remember there was three guys ahead of me and they always say there's, if there's five of you, you know, four of you aren't going to make it kind of a thing. And I didn't really put too much stock into it, but all four of them failed. So I'm like, perfect. This must mean I'm, that's my, my ticket's been pulled. Failed the test? No, or? failed buds. Oh, okay. Cause they had, depl- they had basically went to buds before me Okay, and they all had failed. So I'm like, and jokingly, cause I'm kind of a, told my brother-in-law, sometimes I'm too stupid to, to quit things sometimes. <laughs> and I decided to do something. So I remember I got there and I thought, oh, this is great. Four guys had failed. So I'm good to go. And that's kind of to circle back to your initial question. All those little things, my dad trying to outdo my dad, feeling like I needed to earn my freedom. And I also felt now that I bring this back, I felt underutilized. I was a mechanic at the time. I liked being a mechanic, but I felt like I was a tool for something else. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be used fully. I wanted to feel like I was hitting the rev limiter, if that makes sense. Yep. So that's, that's a, thank you for that. Um, so what was, how hard is Buds? I mean, I've, I've read all these, all the books. You and I have talked about some of the famous Navy SEALs who mm-hmm. are always talking on podcasts and writing books and I've read them. Um, but I, I'd love to just hear firsthand. I've never asked you this before, but what, what is that really like? Just to grind. Yeah. Just to grind. I'm, really, if, if you've been doing construction your whole life, it's, it's that kind of deal where you wake up early you work hard, it hurts, you keep going and you do it again and again and again and again. And all my friends who are usually hard tradesmen or worked in fields did really good. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the professional athlete types, I don't think do as some, some do. I have some friends, who are professional athletes who did really well than some most, mostly who didn't. And I think, and this is a theory is when you're really good at something, it probably comes easy. Mm-hmm. So when it came time to grind, a lot of them I don't think really had that capacity already versus I had a friend who worked in the fields in Stockton. He's been grinding his whole life. He, not a big deal to him, you know? Yeah. And a couple of friends who did construction. There were roofers or like just construction work, just normal people, but they knew how to grind. And that's, that'd be the best way to put it. And I think I had a few advantages that I didn't read all the books. I didn't know what was coming. And I just took it day at a time. Ignorance is bliss. I just knew that I wanted to outdo my old man that I wanted to earn my freedom and that I was just going to keep going until I couldn't go no more. So I always ask myself, can I keep going? It's like, yeah, I just kept going. It's not for everyone. It's hard. There's a reason a bunch of people quit. Uh, <clears throat> it just depends. Nothing How- in particular is hard, but doing all of it all the time relentlessly becomes very hard. What percentage of people quit? Oh, shoot. I don't even know. A lot. Oh, you give your best guess. Most stats, by the way, I've heard are BS anyways, but I've heard it's a really high number. Well, here's, here's, here's a way to look at it. So when I went to boot camp, I want to say there was like 220 something guys who all had SEAL contracts. So they had competed in their region and they got the green light to go to boot camp, which is to go to buds, right? Mm-hmm. Out of those 220, that, in that specific boot camp, I think 11 of us actually went, became SEALs. And then I think of the guys who they call it basically going through buds one time, because some time guys will get hurt, they'll get rolled. And it's, you just get hurt. So, and if you're liked, believe it or not, you can sometimes get a second chance at butts. But 
not everybody gets that. But out mm-hmm. of that group, I want to say six or seven went straight through, like started with one class, finished with one class, or I, how can I say this? Went to boot camp with the same guys and graduated with the same guys, about six. Out of 200? 200. 220-ish, yeah. Okay. But that doesn't count because I don't know how they're doing their statistics. But if they're yeah. doing a BUDS class, which is there's already been the filter of boot camp, the filter of a program called pre-BUDS where guys are dropping out, getting hurt, or who knows, getting divorces, all kinds, you name it, it happens. Mm-hmm. But that number would be, I want to say that number was like 150, I'm guessing. And then that number, I think we graduated though of that group, 50 something people. So, but we also took on people who had gotten rolled before or gotcha. hurt. Does that make sense? Yeah, Each step along the way, you're, <clears throat> you're picking up bodies of guys who yeah. got hurt or had some sort of situation where they got held back. One of the questions I was thinking about is, you know, a lot of people, there's a term out there right now, EQ. Are you familiar with that? No. Emotional intelligence. Okay. And, you know, a lot of people, they they lose their, you know what, over whatever. And we see it all the time. People get rattled and triggered, triggered over things that are not that big of a deal. And I've met, I told you I've met two Navy SEALs now. I, I can't remember the other gentleman that was at an event I was at. But one of the things that I've always wondered is how do you, how do you deal with those super stressful situations that you guys go through and still work as a team, still hold your composure and, you know, compartmentalize fear or whatever it is and move forward and like take care of your bros. That's a question I have because I'm in all these leadership groups with guys and I always think about how do guys function so well in the most stressful situations that I could ever think of? Lots of training, okay. lots of repetitions. Repetition is the father of learning just over and over. And training is always based off real, real world scenarios where things went sideways typically. So you're always kind of put into this really bad scenario where there's not a lot of good answers and you have to choose the worst or the best of the worst answers and make it happen and try and take care of your guys. And all through training, And I think this is new. I want to say probably in the past 15 years, they've implemented a lot of whole man concept where they're trying to get people to have like positive mental attitudes, think about their training and breathing techniques. And maybe they were doing that beforehand, but I remember it was a really big push for my class and they kind of had some unique, I I always joke and call them shamans, like different yoga instructors and all these different kind of, I would say non-standard at the time for the military to Mm -hmm. have a part of training that were kind of helping us with stretching and just a lot of, we had a lot of education on situational awareness and stress and it's always stressful. It's always stressful. So, and I guess also as well, when your instructors have been there and done that, there's a lot of mentorship. So you might go out in buds, get beat down really bad. Then Friday, whatever, one of the instructors happens to be, he'll pull a handful of guys aside and mentor you. And then going forward, you keep those relationships because one of my buds instructors became my platoon chief later. So all that, all these guys are pouring into people that they, they deem are worthy of the events to come, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Kind of went down a little rabbit trail there for a second. No, that was good. But ultimately lots and lots of training, lots of training. And it's in all, there's so much, can I say this? So much planning and forethought. And you're always thinking of your primary alternate, your contingency and your emergency plan. Like that's, you've got, four things hashed out. And ultimately when things go bad, all those plans kind of are somewhat out the window anyway, Mm -hmm. and it becomes pickup basketball. But the thing is having that framework gives everybody something to play off of. And if everyone knows the rules of the game, then everyone can play their part. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but ultimately lots of repetitions and we're constantly, constantly being pushed and leadership is constantly pushed. You're constantly being challenged. I was, I got to hang out with Greg Olson, a football player. Mm -hmm. I don't really watch football, but he used to play for, forgive me, Greg, I think the Panthers anyways. So when he was hanging out with a group of us, we were asking him questions about training at his level. And one of the things he said was when they went to practice, they always did the exact same thing every single time. He's like, all they were trying to do was pick up a little, an inch of improvement. Mm -hmm. They weren't doing, I mean, it it was just always the same play over and over and over again. So that's interesting that, you know, 
that's how you, that's repetition. what I'm hearing you guys did too. Repetition. Um, there's so much repetition, like specifically with shooting, so much repetition, like dry firing, going nice and slow. I always joke with people who want to learn to shoot. They're always trying to go fast, I'm like go slow and go perfect. When it's time to go fast, no one's going to need you to tell you to speed up. You'll speed up on your own. So go slow and be deliberate now. And when the time comes, you'll, you won't need to be told to go fast. So and that's that whole perfect repetitions. Well, this is a, a question that I have for you that I just thought of. What? Because right now, you know, you're at least what I know of you now, you're in a different place in life. Mm -hmm. You're working on real estate investments, you know, living the married life. And um, what what did you take away from that experience that is helping you today? Like, how does that, you just talked about repetition. You talked about, I love the shooting stuff because I shoot guns too. And I find a lot of parallels from mm -hmm. shooting specifically long range mm -hmm. and controlling my breathing. And uh, so, so what have you found that's been something transferable that still shows up in your life today? Shoot, probably everything I did. Yeah, It was very, very useful. Probably the ability to deal with stress Yeah, and the ability to, keep doing the next thing, the next right thing and not projecting too far out because there's just too many variables. So it's like, what's the next right thing? Go for it, execute and just kind of reassess and move, reassess and move because no long-term plan usually sticks around or stays consistent long enough to actually be seen through mm -hmm. for me, at least it seems like there's a lot of uh, dynamic movement in my life. So living in the moment, but you also mentioned your ability to deal with stress. Is there any other tactics I heard you say living in the moment, which I believe in that too. I wouldn't say living in the moment, but like I always have a long-term plan, Okay, but always be willing to flex and yeah. don't let flexing like blow your mind. Like some people who are real, like super duper rule followers, they'll have a plan. And when they deviate from the plan, it really irks them. It puts them off the path. They can't stop, reassess and move forward. Does that, does that make sense? Oh yeah. Like the rule has been broken. Their, their mind is blown. We need to all stop. We need to like re rethink everything. It's like, no. The goal is, you know, X, what's the next best step to get X right now from where we're at? Well, let's, let's do that. That's kind of what I'm doing with this podcast. So you're talking about dealing with stress and so many people right now are stressed to the max. You know, you got balloons in the sky from Russia or whatever the news is telling us and crypto, whatever it is that's going on right now, mm -hmm. people are stressed. Mm -hmm. And I, if you would, what are some other things that you've learned to do to deal with stress you've said being flexible and being okay with things changing but if, if you would it's a tough one for me i did a lot of close air support and that's stressful and i found myself hovering around people who are naturally what i would call not stress victims one of my friends he's like a total surfer bro nothing gets this guy really fired up. It always sounds like he's like high. He's not. If you didn't know him, you'd think this guy's constantly high, but he's mm -hmm. just real slow on the radio talking. He kept it cool. And after doing a lot of work with him, I realized, why am I getting all fired up? Yeah. Why am I letting my emotions get revved up unnecessarily? And then I really analyzed it. Is my heart rate increasing, helping me or hurting me? Am I thinking more clearly or less clearly? And is this perceived urgency or real urgency? Perceived urgency, I would say, is the number one cause of stress for me. Mm -hmm. And then I would say the other thing that causes stress would be too many options. So you have so many options. So it's like the presence of many options and perceived urgency. So I always ask myself, how urgent, how urgent is this really? Mm -hmm. And how, how many options do I really have? And can I sift through them quickly? And that in itself typically will funnel me into a path and create movement. And creating movement, I believe, alleviates stress, especially if there's a goal. Does that, does that add up? Yeah. Yeah. I heard, um, I heard really looking at something as it is and not worse than it is. I heard uh, being around people who m model living with peace. Mm hmm was you learned it from someone else. Absolutely. It's a, absolutely it's a, and, and all throughout what you said, I've heard everything is a learned skill. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's important for people to hear because so much of the time people look at people who are successful in any arena, Navy SEALs, money, whatever. And they just, they almost think that, well, if only this, I would be there too. 
And it's like, well, no, they learned skills. They applied themselves. Like you talk about repetition over and over and failure over and over and trying the right thing. So yeah, there was a lot there. You have to be willing and able to fail continually and stop looking at people and thinking it's easy for them. The reality is it's not easy for them. They're just trying to not complain. And it was hard. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't met a single person who's truly successful that says, oh, that it came easy to me. That thing came, maybe they're out there. I haven't met that person. I haven't either. It's like, everything came easy to me. Mm -hmm. Anything worth doing is difficult and hard, and it's going to probably rock you. So let's talk a little bit about money. Uh, you and I met uh, around the idea of investing in real estate. And if I remember your story correctly, when you moved to San Diego, you bought a property down there. Love that area, Coronado. And, you know, walk me through from Coronado to here, kind of with what you're doing today and why you're interested in real estate, if you would. Um, I'll try to say long story short, but it's usually a long story long. Wave top here, went to Bud's, moved my wife down there, wasn't supposed to because you don't get paid. Essentially, the Navy will pay you for your spouse if for you to have housing. But some people fail Bud's. They don't pay until you make it through Bud's. Oh. So I moved her down there anyway. We got an apartment in Point Loma, did that for a little bit. And soon as we were getting that BH for us as a couple, I bought a house in a place called Lemon Grove, lived there. It was pretty much turnkey. I think I did very little to it, sat on it for maybe two years. The OIC of my first platoon, his dad had a construction company, if I remember correctly, and told us they were building a new base on a part of town that was not desirable. Mm -hmm. And I saw that as like inside information, like basically being the ins insider trading yeah. kind of a thing. I'm like, okay, told my wife we're moving there. She was not thrilled about it bought that house. And I think she moved into it while I was on deployment and it was being remodeled while I was on deployment without me. And that's how I got into that house. If that's kind of what you're asking. Yeah. And then what year was that? And, and then when did you end up selling it? And I believe 2014 and I sold it in 2020. Okay. Then it ended up being, it was, a, it was a really good deal for us at the time. My realtor said it was the most money he'd seen anybody made on a property in that short amount of time. It really, really worked out well for us. And that whole area ended up blowing up, ended up being a really good deal. But it's that you have to listen and know, how can I say this? First off, we got lucky. Second of all, I had a mentor who was in my ear. Because I remember telling, because the amount of money they wanted for this property was well beyond my perception of, you know, I bought a house in Reading for 180 grand. Mm -hmm. And I was buying this piece of junk in San Diego for significantly more money. Mm -hmm. And I had the VA loan. I want to say it was like three and a half percent at the time. Yep. And my buddy goes, hmm, how far is it from the beach? I'm like, about three blocks. It's like, well, never again in your life is someone going to give you 3% on that much money on a house three blocks from the beach. Yeah. You have to buy it. It's like, you need, he's like, you need to man up and buy it. And at the time he, he said the magic words that would irk me. He knew that would irk me to man up and buy it. So I bought it and ended up being a great deal. So, so the proceeds from that house got us back up in Northern California through uh, circumstances we weren't prepared for. We had a, a passing in our family. We were actually planning on going to Idaho, but brought us back to Reading. Here we are. And now I have this, this chunk of money and I've been looking and getting into investing in real estate through, I don't want to go back too far, but fast. The Navy taught me about money. Boot camp gives you a basic lesson. And then fortunately, SEAL team has so many different people. I had a guy from Wall Street in my platoon I had a couple officers in my platoon who sat down and made a PowerPoint on how investing works for the platoon. Wow. And when I saw that, it blew my mind. I'm like, how come I didn't learn this in school? What, like what? Yeah. Like, wait, I pump, like I'll stop, pump the brakes. And I just started slowly educating myself slowly. And that brought me here. And I realized that I enjoy real estate. I understand it to a degree. And I think it's a good thing for me. And I primarily enjoy it. And I think you're going to do best at things that you enjoy. So that brought me here and been running around trying to find property and numbers aren't necessarily what I'd like them to be. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of looking and passing <laughs> nope, yeah. for the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Real estate's one of those weird things that it's always a better deal a year from now, right? I mean, even when you bought your 2014 property, you had hesitation, right? Oh yeah. What are, so you said you like real estate and, and I know, I know enough about you that I know you're a student mm -hmm. and you're always asking great questions, way, really good questions. What do you like about real estate? I like that it's a physical thing. People are always going to need homes, the tax incentives. And I'm deep down inside, I'm a wheeler and dealer. 
I love to buy and sell cars, boats, motorcycles, and houses fall into that same thing. It's a, it's a thing that I get to move and I get to see it. And it's also something I can work on and put my hands on and I understand it. And though it is emotional based, the value of a home, it's a much slower roller coaster, it seems, in the stock market. Mm -hmm. And I like that I can look at an area and be like, no matter what, this area is desirable. I can't say that about the S&P 500. It's always going to be doing well, better than probably most, but there's going to be times where it takes a dump and yeah. there's nothing I can do about that. And I can't foresee it, right? I yeah. can't watch a neighborhood go down. I can't watch a neighborhood come up. I can't go to a city council meeting and hear about something that's being built. You know, that's yeah. happened. Maybe if I was in Wall Street, I would know about things that right. were coming my way. But the fact is I, I'm just too far away from it, I feel. Yeah, it's funny you say that. I. I saw this graph on social media of the, the SVB bank mm -hmm. in the Silicon Valley, the day that it, and it, it, the graph of their stock, it literally goes like this one day all the way down. And what's ironic is two weeks before that, it was the Forbes had all these ads that it was one of the top banks to invest in. Jim Cramer with mad money was touting about it two weeks before that happened. And, you know, it dropped 90, hundred percent in one day. I was going to post it, but I didn't because I didn't, I didn't know what would come of it. But my thought was this is like, I've never seen that happen with real estate. Not in one day. Like the 08 crash was one of the worst ones we've ever seen, right? Peak to trough, we dropped 50%, but it was from 2008 to 2012. It was not one day. It's a big punch, but it's slower. Yep. And it's just easier for me to conceive that. You, you can watch a neighborhood grow or shrink versus that bank just fell out. But at the end of the day, that's why it's called investing and not making money because there's there's an element of risk, right? Yeah. And the ease of investing in a bank versus the ease of investing in real estate, risk versus reward, right? Yeah. And that risk. Yeah. Which normally it shouldn't have been a risk. Yeah. But it was a risk. It was. Well, now, you know, a lot of people have had the mentality that if I just keep my cash in the bank, that's no risk. And I think people are starting to understand now that uh, your cash actually needs insurance. That's a new thought to so many people right now. You you mean I need insurance on my money in the bank? Um, the other thing people are learning about cash is that it can it, the value of the dollar can go up and down, and and so it, it's really an interesting time right now for people to start thinking about your cash isn't as safe as you have thought it is. Oh yeah, well we're basically moving zeros from a, one spreadsheet, a digital spreadsheet, to another with no physical moving of money. And if you think of, a lot of people don't realize that when you go to the bank, if you want to pull out all your money, there's a good chance that you can't today yep. or tomorrow. Because why would they keep all that money on hand when they can just move zeros around? And people talk about digital currency. Well, what do you think a credit card is? We, we've been doing that for a long time, I feel. Yep. We've not had actual physical money. And like I said, the value of the dollar can go down. There's a lot going on. There's a, there's a lot to this. And I don't know enough to fully get into it, but I know where my comfort zone is. I like physical assets. And I'm starting to learn about different commodities right now that I, I find more valuable. So Paul, you've had a very rich life and I don't just mean rich with money, but you said it yourself, like before the seals, you, you had the hot rod and you felt you had a life that you said you felt like you hadn't earned or deserved. And then you were a Navy seal and you were, you did that for a long time. You bought this house down in San Diego that you had really good luck with the timing on that. I know you're married to a great gal and now you're living in Reading, which I love Reading and I know you love Reading too. Um, what does the word at this stage of your life, whole or wholehearted mean to you? Wow. Super hard. Wholehearted. It's my continual movement forward to try and be Christ-like, which has been extremely difficult as you grow and become more aware of yourself and your place in this world for God, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because at one point my spirituality was, or my, my faith was completely rocked overseas and kind of seeing things and then coming back and re and realizing I was actually living off the glory of good things God had done for me throughout my life. Mm -hmm. And I, I look back, I'm like, wow, I'm really lucky. I've came through this pretty much unscathed. My, I'm still married. Most of my friends are not married. We've been fortunate financially. We've been able to take care of my mother as well in the absence of my father. And there's just been a lot of luck, you know? And mm -hmm. it's like, is that luck? Is that grace? Are those miracles? I, I believe it is grace. I believe there it's what God wants. It's like, all right, God, how do I be a good steward of what you've given me? And does it have to be money? No, could be people, could be tools, could be opportunities. But it seems that 
sometimes God will put me in a position where I'm able to use a blessing or honor it in a way that has down the road positive I guess you could say positive actions that I wasn't tracking, but sure. only by being faithful in the moment yeah. did I enter into those things, not knowing what was going to be fruitful or not. And then at the end there's fruit. And I just have faith that that's the thing to do. So I keep mm-hmm. doing it and I'm going to keep doing it. And if that means I get called to leave to go to Idaho for whatever reason and give up on my real estate investing, so be it. Cause there, I will be provided for in some way or another. And I, I don't have fear in that, which is goes back to dealing with stress it's easier to not stress about things when you know there's a plan for your life mm-hmm. and there's only so there you're in control to a degree but if you just keep doing the next right thing and you keep having an ear to the, towards the lord I, I don't know it makes it less stressful for me like people are stressing about the world falling <clears throat> apart and i'm like well I'm not too really worried about it <laughs> yeah yeah two words i think of when i hear what you just said is surrender and acceptance And, you know, when we're in that place of being surrendered, like we really could sense the calling to sell everything and go somewhere and we would do it. And then, but there's times in my life where that's not where I'm at. I'm trying, you know, and it's, Mm -hmm. but staying in that place. And then the acceptance thing is like, we can't change. We know what we can change, what we can. And Mm -hmm. half the stuff that's going on in the news, like I do not have control over that. And, and I, I try not to get swept away over that. Yeah. I don't want to go too deep because when I think of this, I have a friend former teammate. He's now in leadership in Arizona. He owned a very profitable business. God called him, sold the business. And now he's, I can't, I'm not sure if he's Senate in Arizona or what he's doing, but that was impressive. Just gave, most people would say the gold nugget. He gave the gold nugget away because he felt called to something higher and now he's doing it and he's, he's doing it. Well, good for him. We need those people, man. We do. Well, Paul, thank you so much for being here. Mm-hmm. I appreciate it so much. I learned a lot. And uh, thank you guys for watching. Please make sure to like, subscribe, leave a comment, and download.